Uh, today's scripture reading, uh, lesson from the Word, is 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. And I'm going to preface this with a pronunciation guide that was handed to me. So we will allow a little bit of grace this morning. <laughs> Alright. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Ara. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him the Lord had given him victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now the bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken a captive, a young girl from Israel. She and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure me cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go. The king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten, ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. Then, <clears throat> When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come, have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of leprosy. And are not... I should have given you those too. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, uh, Banna and... Far, 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 the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel. <coughs> Could not wash in them and be cleansed. So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean, clean like that of a young boy. Very good. All right. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. So today, we're going to hang out in 2 Kings. We did that, you may not remember, but we did that back um, at the end of June. If you remember, we were in the second chapter of 2 Kings back then. And we were looking at Elijah, the prophet's last day, if you remember that. And, and uh, I, we were all looking at what Elijah, um, who was the mentor of Elisha that we're talking about today, we all looked at what, how he spent his last day with the question for ourselves, how would we spend our last day on earth? And we saw in Elijah's example that he spent that day getting ready to meet God by being thankful by letting others know how much he loved them, and most importantly, by living. He didn't freeze and wait for the inevitable, but he went about living his life. And uh, we saw that as, a, as a, a good example for us in our lives. Um, anyways, that last day that Elijah spent on earth, he spent it with his understudy, his friend, his partner, Elisha. And Elisha was picked up Elijah's mantle 
once he uh, was taken up in that chariot of fire uh, to heaven, and, and that kind of kick-started his miracles, a working prophet um, vocation. Uh, and so this is kind of an Elisha story, but it, today it's, it's more of a Naaman story than anything. Um, and as you heard read, Naaman was uh, a commander of the army of the king of Aram. And uh, Naaman had a lot going for him in his life, if you were paying attention when we heard the word read. He had stature, he had respect, he had a, a very well-decorated career, he had the blessings of God in his life. He was a, a great soldier, a great leader, but he also had leprosy. He contracted leprosy, which was, in that day, a very miserable and untreatable disease. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, um, there was a great social stigma that went with that when you got uh, leprosy. It pretty much had the tendency of destroying your life once you got it. People avoided you like you had the plague, and you were cast out of the community, and you lived on the fringes of society. So it completely disrupted your world and ruined your life. And that getting leprosy, as you can see, would make your job leading an army pretty hard to do if you had that affliction. Um, and so it, it turns out that uh, the... Uh, army and army had captured a young Israelite girl. She then became the servant of Naaman's wife. And one day they were together, and that Israelite girl said to Naaman's wife that there was that God had a prophet in Samaria that could cure her husband of leprosy. Uh, and this was, of course, incredible news uh, because here she was hearing that somebody could cure her husband of this incurable disease that had destroyed his life and her life with it. So she's like, sign me up, you know? So she, uh, she uh, runs off, she tells Naaman the good news. He's super excited because he's hearing now that, that his life can be turned around. He, his life can change, he can be healed, he can, be, he, can, he can gain his life back. And so he goes to his king, Aram, and he told him what he'd heard. And so the, the king gave the commander of his army his blessing to go and see uh, this prophet in Israel. He even sent along a letter from himself to the king of Israel informing Naaman's intention once he got there that, that he was there to be healed. And so Naaman packs this letter up and, and all the, this whole treasure trove of gifts and he heads out for Samaria. And, and so when the letter arrived, from the king, from king of Aram to the king of Israel. And instead of it opening the door to Naaman's healing, it caused a great stir. And, and the king received the letter from, from, from King Aram and he flipped out. He, he tore his robes. That's how you flipped out in those days. You tore your, your clothing. And, and he tore his robes and he effectively said, what the heck am I going to do for this guy? You know, I, am I God? Can I... Raise a dead man back to life. That should give you an indication of how serious and deadly this disease was. Um, why is this guy sending me somebody with leprosy? Is he trying to pick a fight with me or what? So um, Elisha hears the ruckus that's going on in the king's court and he sends word to the king and he basically says, calm down, this fellow's problem is not for you to deal with. This is God's. This is God's business. And he said, you send that fellow my way and I will make sure that he hears and he knows that God is capable and can do this for him. So the king sends Naaman and his entourage towards Elisha's house. And when he arrived, he sees the door open. Naaman's thinking, awesome, now Elisha's going to come out and he's going to do some great and marvelous thing using the power of God. But 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 as, as the, somebody comes out of the house, it's not Elisha at all, it's just some messenger and so the messenger comes up and he said hey I, I got something to tell you Elisha you know he can't be bothered he's still inside the house but he said this he said for you to go and, and go down to the river Jordan and dip yourself in the water seven times and you will be healed you will be cleansed a lot of people are freaking out in this passage by the way now Naaman is freaking out he is blowing a fuse He's hot with anger. 
He says, what? I rode all this way to see Elisha, to, to have him call on the name of, of the Lord his God to heal me. And he can't even be bothered to come out and greet me himself. He sends you out here to meet me. And, he, and, he, and, he tell, and you're telling me that he's telling me to go and dip myself in this nasty River Jordan water. There's better water back home where I came from. What a waste of my time. I can't believe this is happening to me. And so he stomps off in a rage. And luckily, a couple of people from his entourage are level-headed thinkers. They run up to him and they say, hold on, listen now, listen to us. If, if the prophet, if the prophet had told you to go and do some great big thing, wouldn't you have done it? So how much more then when he's telling you to simply go and be cleansed? Why not give it a try? What if it's that simple? So Naaman listened and he thought about it for a moment. He said, you know, maybe... Maybe these guys are right. Maybe, maybe it is that simple. What have I got to lose if I trust God and I give this a try? So he did that. He did as God's prophet Elisha told him. He goes down to the river. He, he dips himself seven times. And when he came out, as you heard read, the man of God told him just exactly what God was going to do. And it happened that he, his skin became new and, and soft, just like a newborn baby. So as we look at what happened here, obviously Naaman needed to be healed, and only God was going to be able to do that. He was expecting Elisha to do some marvelous big thing, something spectacular, you know, maybe he heard stories. He was expecting Elisha to call down the power of God in some big flashing way to heal him, but instead Elisha doesn't do that at all. He sends a messenger, as you heard, to tell him, Effectively, look for God in the little things. Look for God in the little things. Now, why do you think that happened that way? Do you think, do you think maybe it was Elisha, Elisha's way of making sure that God got all the glory in that? Or, or, or could it be that, you know, Naaman needed an opportunity to prove that he had some faith? What about us today? As, as we're living our lives today, uh, one thing I think about is, as I'm watching Naaman, and, I, and I'm seeing some similarities with him and me, and maybe you do too, do you ever try to make things harder than they need to be? And, 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 and are we ever trying to interject our expectations into the business of God? Are we trying to keep God in a little box, you know, that we understand and we think He's going to work in those parameters? Where's our faith and how do we trust? How many of you ever said, well, that can't be right. That's just too simple. Have you ever said that? You're like, well, that, it has to be harder than that. Everything's harder than that. How can it be that simple? Something's not right here if it's that easy. I know I've said that. And why do we complicate things? Why do we make things harder? Is it, is it to make things fit in our picture of how things should be? And yet here is God doing what God does. He's healing, he's redeeming, he's saving. And he never once asks our opinion on how he should go about it. Mike, I'm going to do this. How do, you, how do you think I should do it? He's never once asked me that. Assuming he's never asked you that. God never asks us how he, how, how he should do something that only he alone can do. It's his business. It's none of our business. It's how he chooses to do it. So as, as far as I can see, he simply asks us three things. Come to him, trust him, and then get out of his way. And I think maybe that's the lesson here for us today. God 
through his word today, tells us, come to him. You know? Naaman needed something that nobody else on earth was going to be able to give him. So he went to God, effectively. At least he figured out later that's who, who he was going to. But, you know, there, there's no one better to turn to. There's, there, there's no one else that's got what we really and truly need. Be it healing, be it deliverance, be it restoration, redemption, discernment, whatever it is. God says, come to me for that. And, and then when we come to him, he's asking us to do something else, and that's trust him. You know, And it, and it can't be lip service. It can't be just going through the motions. It, it has to be fully handing something over to God. And, and that means not just saying that we're giving it to him and then, and then holding on to it still. That's one of my favorite things to do in life. But actually, truly handing something off to him. Letting go and letting God. And then if we do that, there's one more thing to do. It's pretty simple, and it's get out of His way. And you know, when we're continuing to hold on to those things that we give to Him, we're, we're getting in His way. How many of you like to cook? you like a lot of people standing around in your kitchen when you're trying to cook? Get out of the way. He doesn't need us after we come to Him and we're trusting Him. Um, you know, <laughs> to stand around in the midst of it and cause problems. He's, get out of His way. He's got it from here. That's hard to do if you're a control freak or you're impatient or all those things that we tend to be. When you think you know how God ought to work, you and I may have ideas how God could and should be tending to our prayers, but He doesn't ask our opinion on that. doesn't need our help. He may go about that healing, that restoration, that deliverance, whatever it is that we're praying for. He may very well go about it in a big, flashy way. I'm assuming you've seen God do some pretty big, amazing things. I hope that you do. Sometimes he works that way, but also sometimes he goes about it in a different way. Sometimes it's a very slow and simple and methodical way. Where you don't even think anything's happening yet. That's, I'm assuming, how Naaman felt when he was getting in that water. Probably dipped himself once and looked. I looked the same. Dipped again. No matter how God does it, it's, it's His way and it's not our way. And, and we we got to give it to Him and, and, and trust and then get out of His way. Um, he already, you know, when He says, come to me, you know, tell me what you need, that's more for our benefit than His. He knows what we need. And then He says, trust me for it. Give me some credit here. I am God. Let me know this for you. And then get out of the way. And so today, I want to do something a little different. Today, I want to give you all a chance to do what Naaman did. We're not going to go down to the river and dip ourselves seven times. But what we are going to do today, if you're willing to do this, I'm assuming you all got a piece of paper and a pen, maybe. Um, raise your hand if you didn't get one. Did anybody come in late and, and not get one?
If you don't use them, I'll give them back to me. I'm going to the other church with them. You need one too? Okay. All right. So anyways, if you got a pen or a pencil or something, um, I want you to write on there what you need from God today. Now those pieces of paper are small, so I think that's part of the trust in this too. You know, you don't have room to write everything down in great detail. I don't care if you just put a little X on there, but if you think in your mind, I'm giving this to God, you know, I, I, I need healing, I need forgiveness, I need deliverance, I need restoration, I need discernment, whatever it may be that you need. And I'm going to do it too. I've got one here too. And I'm going to invite you in. Linda's going to play a little bit. And as you feel led, I'm going to invite you to come up and drop that in the paper. And I'm going to be swirling it around up here. You guys did this another time when this is water-soluble paper, so it's going to be magical when you come up here. You're going to drop it in there, and as I'm stirring it around, it will dissolve. You won't see it anymore. Nobody who comes up after you is going to see it, but God will see it. God knows about it, and God's going to deal with it. So let's do that now if we could for a couple of minutes. God, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for the account of how you healed Naaman of his leprosy as only you could do. And you did it through having him do something simple that he didn't think you would use to restore him. But you did. And you do. And you continue to amaze us with your ways, O oh God. You do it in the big and the flashy things in life, but also in the small and the insignificant, you're still at work to great effect. And so Lord, today we come to you broken, and lacking and aching and struggling. And we're burdened with needs that no one else can tend to. We come to you today to be healed. We come to you today to be restored. We come to you today to be redeemed. We come to you today to be delivered. We come to you today for wisdom. We come to you today for all of our needs. And as we do so, we will trust you for all of them. I think oftentimes, Lord, we struggle with the kind of faith you desire. So help us in our unbelief too. And as we have given these things to you today, and you've now received them, help us to get out of your way. So that in big things and little things, loud ways and quiet ways, obvious and mysterious, you can do what only you can do while we leave you to it. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.